12. We miss you guys. Good to be together for our virtual sermon this weekend. Natalie and Chandler are bringing the next message from our Living on Mission series. And we got J Team on Sunday. Love you guys. Hey guys, we're in another week in this series on living on mission and this week Chandler and I get to bring you a message about um, living on mission when facing adversity. Maybe adversity is too big a word, um, but I think if we if it, we break it down to its definition, whether it's burdens or troubles or difficulties, I think you could almost call it just less than ideal circumstances. Um, we're talking about in this series being on mission, I think about a mission, then it's kind of like you're an agent or a soldier and soldiers are the ones that get orders, right? They're the ones that have a mission to complete, but you never send a soldier on the mission of like going on a cruise. But I think that's kind of how we expect Christianity to be like being a disciple, then we just are cruising and our only orders are to enjoy the amenities. Um, but then reality kind of hits and we're actually soldiers on a battleship that's actually going to, out to war. And there's a lot of fighting that happens and a lot of difficulty and suffering. And I think we forget that and then it kind of knocks us off course or can all of a sudden shake everything up and almost make us forget about the mission itself when adversity comes. But the reality is if this is what we're built for, if this is what we're called to, then adversity, difficulty, less than ideal circumstances should be the place where we shine, where God's glory is most recognized because our weakness is so obvious. And so we're gonna take some time to talk about that this week. I think specifically in this season, we are running into all sorts of less than ideal circumstances. Ideally, we would still be meeting in community, that that's something that God commanded, that even in Genesis, when he created Adam, he realized it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. And so maybe you find yourself in a house where you're alone eight to 10 hours out of the day because your parents are gone working. And so we find ourselves surrounded by temptation or just depressed or lonely. And that might seem like such a small thing, but I think in this season, we're all kind of realizing how difficult that can truly be, that it can lead to a sense of purposelessness, especially when we feel like our purpose is people, that we're called to create more disciples, but how do we do that when we're in a home alone? And how do we not just fall into a pit of despair and feeling like getting out of the bed in the morning is the hardest thing that we can have to do in the day. But I think almost acknowledging that, giving us permission to do that this week and go, that might be the hardest thing that we're facing. There are also so many much more difficult things, whether that's financial strife, drama at, within your household, relationally, even spiritually feeling doubt or dryness, or even facing a lot more temptations because you have less accountability now. There's a lot of hard things that are facing us right now. And getting to name all of ours to look at and go, yeah, this is a hard time right now. This is less than ideal. I think if I was gonna be on a cruise ship, I'd want my money back. And we can go to the Great Commission this week and ask God again, what's our call in this? What's the mission that you're calling us to? So for that, going to open up your Bibles again to Matthew 28, uh, starting in verse 19. This is Jesus talking to his disciples right after he's risen from the dead, and this is what he says to them. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think like we we read this and we pass over it quickly and we go, okay, it has like marching orders for me and it has something to do, but we skip that part that it's full of, if we took it literally, so much promise from God that he will be with us through all of it, that we have a Jesus like it talks about in Hebrews 4, 15, that was fully man and was tempted and tested in every way so that he can sympathize with us. So it's not only that he just gives orders and then leaves us on our own, but even more so within um, following his commands, we have this promise of God's presence that through this season, through seasons of hardship and adversity, we really get to cling to, to prove that that is true, that God is with us through everything. Even in Romans 8, when it says, um, if God is for us, who can ever stop us? And we really like that verse. But the verses after that are where it says that 
God himself didn't even hold back suffering from his son, that the Jesus who promises to be with us also suffered. And so if God treated his own son that way, we should expect suffering. And then on the other side of that, that despite whatever difficulty, suffering, hardship, pain, unknown, uncertainty comes on the other side, that God's promised love is always there for us and we will not miss out on that, that it will not let us go and that's what we cling to. So today we get to break down some of those things of how Jesus promises to provide for us in the face of suffering and hardships and how he calls us to act and behave and use these times to even glorify him even more. So when it comes to times of adversity, especially with something like a pandemic where everyone is, it seems to be facing some kind of hardship or loss together. We've already talked about a couple of things that we need to understand, which is first that God is with us, that he equips us, that he's sovereign, that he's in control and that he will use us. But we want to see practically how we can continue to endure hardship. And Psalms actually gives us a great picture of this. This is what it says <clears throat> in Psalms 1. It said, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners um, or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but who delights in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his laws day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither, whatever um, whatever they do prospers. So... Uh, John Ortberg in the book Soul Keeping, which I've been reading through, talks about this passage here. And he talks about this idea of trees in the Middle East. And this is what he says. In the ancient Middle East, trees were rare. Rain was scarce. Deserts were plentiful. But if a tree were planted by a river, it was no longer dependent on uncertain weather or the surface conditions of the soil. It could flourish all the time because its roots allowed the water to stream into each part of the tree to bring life. You couldn't see the roots, but no one could miss the green leaves or the fresh fruit. See, what Psalms is telling us here is that when we are planted by the river, when when we are intaking this living water that, that Christ provides, that we are a tree and we plant ourselves in the living water of God, that we are connected to this water source, that we are no longer affected by outside circumstances. See, a tree that's planted by a river is no longer going to be affected by storm or drought or whatever hard season may come. And the crazy thing is if there's hard years uh, for like seasons for this tree, it will still produce fruit because it's connected to a water source. And same with us as Christians, that when we walk through hard years, maybe you thought like the year 2020 was going to be your year and then coronavirus hit and it is not your year. But the beautiful thing is if we're truly Christians who go, we are going to be planted in the living water. We are going to dig our roots so deep into the stream that is Jesus that we are not going to be affected by outside seasons, then we will produce fruit regardless of what adversity strikes. You could literally face adversity every year for the rest of your life. Every day, every moment, you could face adversity. And there are people in Scripture sometimes we see that does happen. And while I hope that doesn't happen to you, what I want you to understand is that if we can understand this truth, that we need to see where our being and our soul is rooted that we will still bear fruit, that we will still feel refreshed, that we will still have peace as long as we are connected to our life source, which is Jesus. And so here's how to do that practically. For a lot of you guys, what that's going to look like is you are going to need times where you spend time in devotion, where you reflect, where you pray to God, where you say, will you help me? Will you get me through this? Because without reliance on God, without coming to him every day, we will stray aside, we will forget, we will grow weak in times of adversity. But when you are weak in times of adversity, Christ can make you strong. And that is why it's important that practically, even if you're not feeling it, that you wake up, that you spend time in prayer, that you spend time reading scripture, taking in truth, and you pursue planting your roots in a living water. Thanks, Chandler. The next thing that we have to remember is that God will not waste our pain if we let him use it for our holiness. Trials and hardships, difficulties, or less than ideal circumstances have this amazing power to grow in us empathy. Christians who have never been through anything that look like they, you know, like a toy that has never been unboxed, it's got like greater value or whatever. I don't know whoever does that where they don't open the toys, but they save them for 20 years, so they're worth a lot of things. 
um, we think that I want to be a Christian that's like wrapped in bubble wrap and clean and perfect and hasn't ever been through anything. But God's not looking for trophies to put on a display case on his trophy shelf. He's looking for tools, for vessels to administer love and grace and compassion. And that means that we, we get our hands dirty, that we probably a good and faithful servant looks much more like a broken, chipped, faded piece of pottery than that perfect piece of china, that fine china that's like put away in a cabinet that's never seen any use. Instead, as we go through hardship, we grow an ability to connect with others, to be endearing and welcoming, to be on their same level, that God can actually use us in the lives of others to draw people towards us, to actually make more disciples. So I think the first thing is that it grows empathy in us. Empathy is a character trait and that it also grows just more character. We value comfort so highly that we we um, make our whole entire lives accommodate our comfort. And I think comfort's the thing that God scratches his head at and goes, why do you love that garbage heap of comfort? What I value most is character. And character is born out of difficulty and uncomfortability. And the more that we get fixated on our own values, the more I think we're going to have a little bit of um, disagreement with God. When we start to understand what he values most, then we can look at our perspective and our situation and start to see it through his lens of, oh, is this actually building in me something good, something valuable? Am I growing character through this season? Like it says in James 1, that trials bring suffering, but that brings endurance and patience and that grows in us strength. And those are things that are of ultimate value to God. I also think that seasons like this, that there is less to hope for in this world, that suddenly the things that we were excited for, our plans that we looked forward to, our comforts, our uh, maybe our community even, the things that are easily distractions from us truly fixing our eyes on Christ are now kind of taken away. But Colossians 3 says that our, our focus should be fixed on heaven where Christ is seated on the throne. And with all of the things that we have distracting us on a regular basis, it's it's really hard to focus on hoping for eternity. But in a season like this, where a lot of those things are stripped away, we get to finally fix our eyes on heaven and know that this is the closest that I'm ever going to get to hell. It might suck a little bit at certain seasons, but this is the only hell I'm ever going to experience. And then I'm going to hope for the eternity that I get to have after that. And we start to grow in us like a holy longing and love for heaven and uh, hopefulness for it to come one day. And even through that, I think the last thing that we grow is trust in God. Um, James, in James 4, um, verses like 13 through 17, it talks about how we love to boast about tomorrow, but all we are is a mist. How do we get to be the ones to say what's going to happen next? And I think that's kind of what God did in this season. Not that he made Corona happen, but that he watches it and he goes, see, like, you don't have all the plans. You don't have it all figured out. And we should instead kind of submit all of our lives to God and go, if you will it, then this will be done. If it's your will, then my plans might come through. But in the end, it's your will, God, not mine. But sometimes we put ourselves in his position and start to presume upon our own plans. I think God is not glorified when our plans go perfectly. God is most glorified when we find our peace and rest in him. And we can do that even in seasons of uncertainty. The beauty of times of uncertainty is when we don't know what comes next, we serve a God who does. And even in hardships, we still have a mission. And Chan's going to share with that with us. Like Nat said, a lot of us are facing times of adversity right now. And some of us might not be, and that's okay. But for some of you, you might be feeling the stress of families, financial burdens, uh, you might be feeling the mental burden of being in quarantine and just having this sense of cabin fever where you're missing your community. Um, it might be a time of insecurity because you can't connect with people and see where you stand or how people feel about you. But whatever it is, as you walk through adversity, whatever hardship you face, we have this cool promise, which Nat reminded us of, that we get to do this with Jesus. That he walks through adversity with us. And scripture calls us time and time again to stand to remember that God is sovereign, that Jesus is with us, and then that we are equipped by God to stand in adversity. And we find part of that equipping in Ephesians um, 6, verse 10, and it talks about the armor of God. And this is what it says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but, a bit, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the evil, of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. And then that's twice it says to stand, and then one more time it's going to say, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your right waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and request with this in mind. Be alert and always keep praying for the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And here's why we want to use the armor of God in our time of adversity right now. Because in, when these people were facing adversity, when this church in Ephesus was facing hardship and being persecuted, when, when they were walking through difficulty, Paul said, look guys, we need to stand. We flee from temptation, but we stand in adversity. We don't get scared, we don't run away because we understand that God has equipped us. He's given us tools. And some of those might not be super clear, but I just wanna walk through quickly the armor of God and see how they, these are tools that will help us stand in adversity. And the belt of truth is for us to first and foremost understand that we need truth to hold us together. That we need to remind ourselves of God's goodness in times of hardship. The next thing is it talks about the breastplate of righteousness, which is we need to constantly walk in obedience so that we don't stray. Compromising will lead us to downfall, to shying away in adversity, so we need to continue to walk in righteousness and in God's peace and, and be in obedience with Him. The next is it says feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And this seems, uh, it's a really long sentence that might be hard to understand, but it's understanding that Sandals protect us where we are often most vulnerable, and it gives us, the gospel gives us peace to keep marching forward, understanding how important shoes were in armor back then. Um, the shield of faith is remembering why you believe and remembering God, being certain of God and reminding yourself of who he is and why you believe in him in times that are hard and understanding that he is still good. Uh, the helmet of salvation, this is the idea of protecting the whole person with salvation. Um, and the head was your covering, so you would remind yourself that you are not for this world, that your whole being is protected by God and the salvation that he's brought you. And then there's the sword of the Spirit, which is understanding that God is fighting our battles, the Holy Spirit is working in us, and that we have his truth and his scripture to constantly move us forward, so that when we face times of adversity, we won't be shaken, but we can be connected to Christ and say, would, we, would you help me put on your armor so that we can continue to move forward and advance your kingdom, even when hardship strikes? Thanks for joining us. We want to remind you guys that our counseling center is available and our leaders are available. I know Natalie and Chandler were able to talk through some really deep things right now and a lot of people are walking through hard stuff. So we want to make sure you guys know that those resources are available and we love you guys a ton. We're available too. Love you guys. altars where you meet us take me there take me there if you're looking for an offering it's right here my life is here I'll be a living sacrifice for you you're the fire the refiner I want to be consumed I want to be dry by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be dry by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, he is my life. If your glory wants to come in, let it fall. We want it all. 
your fire is consuming Fill this place, set it ablaze I'll be a living sacrifice for you Your fire, the fire I won't be consumed I won't be tried by fire Purify, you take whatever you desire. Lord, is my life. I wanna be tried by fire. Purify, you take whatever you desire. Lord, is my life. So clean my hands, purify my heart. I want to burn for you, only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you. Sacrifice, I want to burn for you, only for you. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire, Lord, is my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord is my life. Cause I want to burn for you, burn for you. Oh, Jesus, for you, I give it all for you, I give it all for you, I give it all for you, Jesus, I give my life for you, give my life for you. I'll give my life for you, Jesus, for you. I give it all for you. 
your glory, for your kingdom. I want to burn for you, only for you. I give it all for you, only for you. I give it all for you. Only for you, I give it all for you. Only for you, Jesus. Only for you. I'll give it all.